Hi guys. So I wanted to come back because I believe that this teaching has been pressed upon my heart. And after a couple dreams that I had, I just believe that um, I was shown that people are not getting um, the grace of God and they're not realizing what Jesus Christ did for them, that he was the lamb. He fulfilled the Passover in numbers and he was the lamb that came physically and gave his life a perfect sacrifice, his perfect blood shed on the cross so that all those that believe upon him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I had this dream that I was standing uh, in this, um, like a, a, on a farm with a bunch of like wooden fences and with pins or pens and there was a lean-to and um, there was a sheepdog there and the Lord said there was a man there I believe represented the Lord and he said all you have to do is whistle and he gave a whistle like when you put your fingers in your mouth and whistle and so I just automatically did that I can't even barely whistle you guys but in the dream I did that and the sheepdog got up ran into the lean-to and herded out all these monkeys baby monkeys they were little baby monkeys and they started going into this chute like and then uh so a couple few baby monkeys started running around being you know playing their little baby monkey games and the lord said whistle again so I whistled again and the sheepdog went and rounded up these little unruly baby monkeys and put them back in line. So it's funny how it was a sheepdog, but there it wasn't sheep. They were unruly baby monkeys. <laughs> and so, um, you know, you guys, I just got to do what the Lord's telling me to do. So, um, and he's really hit home with me, this grace message that he's just, you know, one, one time I had this dream when I first started having dreams and visions that the Lord all night long, you guys, and I didn't realize who the Jews, I mean, I've heard about the Jews or, you know, which they're also the Jews could represent unbelievers as well, because the Jews are un unbelievers they do not believe that Jesus Christ was the promised Messiah they're still wait, waiting for the promised Messiah okay and that's why Jesus went around and told the Jews or the Pharisees the, the the ones that were higher up you know and said look I'm he all you have to do is believe upon me when Nicodemus slipped out and came to Jesus at the camp and said what must I do to be saved he said you must be born again You know, we have to be born again. And how are we born again? Through our belief in Jesus Christ. He was basically telling him, believe upon me. I will baptize you with water. I will give you the Holy Spirit. I, you know, I will do these things because you can't do it. You sit up in the synagogue with this law, 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 rules and laws and laws and laws. And that's not what's going to make you righteous. That's not what's going to enter you into the kingdom because now we're creating a new covenant with man. Okay? Your, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, but I tell you that that is not what will save you. They are dead. And then he goes on before the last supper. He says, I am the bread. Now he is the manna. Okay? And he, he said, anyone that eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood will have everlasting life. Well, how can you do that? How do you do that? You take it in. It's something that you that you look at, you view, you realize. It's look up the definition of drink and you'll see or eat and you'll see. You take something in. So, this is what the Lord has been pressing upon me that there are so many people deceived. They are stuck in their works, they are stuck in their law, and when when you rely upon your works and the law, to make you righteous and without sin when you rely on yourself to make you righteous or without sin you have fallen from grace and that's scriptural you guys these church buildings man oh man 
I tell ya, uh, it floors me because, and I realize I used to be the exact same person. So let's go in and talk about that Jesus is the door. And we're talking about John 10. Okay, so suffice it to say that we see in John 10 regarding Jesus as the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. Mentions nothing about breaking the legs of the sheep. Because back in, in, because we have to look at what Jesus, his parables, he would, at the time he would give a parable. Well, he was looking at something happening during that time period. And he was using that to teach the people he was speaking to. So in those days, the shepherds, if a, if a sheep or a, a lamb would stray, he would break its legs and he would carry it on its shoulders. It's kind of ironic how people show, uh, like the Catholics and all that, they paint pictures with Jesus walking around with a sheep on his shoulders. Well, that, you know, that's depicting what they used to do back in the days. They would break the legs and by breaking the legs of the sheep, of the lamb, he would put that the shepherd would put that lamb around his um, neck and he would carry it. And by doing that, it would, it would create a relationship of trust between them, but it was forced. Hey, I'm going to break this little baby lamb's legs. And then after his legs healed up and the shepherd didn't have to carry him anymore, the lamb or the sheep would stay with the shepherd. It wouldn't wander off anymore. Okay, but Jesus is the good shepherd. He does not break the, the legs of the lamb or the sheep. He gives us free will and he loves us. Okay, so quite to the contrary, Jesus knows his sheep and they know him. Jesus calls his sheep. He searches them out. The good shepherd, Jesus, lays down his life for the sheep. No leg breaking here. If you get out of line, Jesus is not going to break your legs. Why? Because therefore... There is no more condemnation for those who stand in Jesus Christ. There's no more fear, shame, guilt, or condemnation about our sins and the things that we can't help in our lives. Why? Because he was the lamb that died on the cross and gave his life a living sacrifice so that we could have life for the ones that believe upon him. People say, be obedient. Yes, he says, be obedient. He tells those Pharisees, be obedient to the faith. Be obedient to my sayings. What am I saying to you? Believe upon me. Believe upon me. I am he. I give you everlasting life through what I'm going to do on the cross. They didn't realize what he was going to do on the cross, but that's what he did. Bad shepherds break the legs of their sheep. Criminals break legs. Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, does not. So John chapter 10, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. How can we climb up some other way? How can a person do that? When they do that, what are they doing? They're climbing up through their own self-righteousness, through their own works. Okay, not through their faith in what Jesus did for them. They're not resting in Christ. Okay, shepherds frequently herded their sheep into the fields and surrounding countryside in order to find green pastures. At night, they would keep the sheep in temporary sheepfolds. These sheepfolds were made of branches and surrounding brush. This was designed to keep the sheep together for the protection and provision. This makeshift corral of the brush was made with a single opening for the sheep to enter in and exit out. At night, the shepherd would lay himself at the entryway to block any sheep from wandering out and to be a wall against any predator or thief getting in. Stealing sheep was a common practice in those days. One thief would climb over the wall, jump down, grab a sheep, slit its throat, and then hand the dead body over the wall to an accomplice. Number two, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Each flock of sheep have a shepherd to protect and provide for them. The rightful sheep of each flock enters by the door. He doesn't climb over the wall. He doesn't knock down the wall. The shepherd enters one way, the right way to gather his sheep and lead them to where they need to go. Okay, I remember an audible that I heard. Um, the Holy Spirit spoke to me one night before I woke up and said, Each man shall not take his own sheep. I never knew what that meant. Each man shall not take his own sheep. 
because Jesus is the one that is the shepherd. Number three, to him the door opens. Each village had a common sheepfold for when the shepherds brought their sheep home from the fields. It was made of stone walls about six feet or high, higher. The sheep from various shepherds would stay together in this community sheepfold. This stone sheepfold also had one opening to enter and exit through. The shepherds would herd their sheep into the village sheepfold and then return to their homes to sleep. One of them would be assigned or they would take turns guarding the sheep in the entryway as a doorkeeper. John 10, 3. And the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name. With sheep from various shepherds, you might wonder how did they know uh, whose sheep belonged to which shepherd? How did they avoid a mix up of the sheep? Jesus said, and the sheep hear his voice. The sheep knew their shepherd's voice. Sometimes each shepherd had a unique call for his sheep. Other times the shepherd would call his sheep with a song. When he whistled, called, or sung a song, his sheep would know it was time to go with the shepherd. And Jesus also adds, and he calls his own sheep by name. The shepherd gave names to his sheep. He knew each sheep personally. He gave them names so he would call them individually. If Buffy wandered off, he would just call her by name. If Benedict was lagging behind, he'd call him to speed it up. Names are important. Names enable the shepherd to give instructions to a specific individual sheep. And we are given new names, you guys. And he leads them out, and when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. When we think of shepherd, we may have an image of a shepherd driving the sheep from behind. We may picture in our minds a shepherd with a stick whacking the sheep in line, but this is not the case. Shepherds lead their sheep, and the sheep follow him. If you go to Israel today, you will see a shepherd walking in front of a herd of his sheep. Shepherds lead. Sheep follow. They know the shepherd's voice. Number five. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, as they do not know the voice of strangers. Sheep are very skittish and easily frightened. They respond to the warm and familiar voice of their shepherd but they immediately know and fear the strange voice of someone other than their shepherd. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Jesus used the imagery of a shepherd with his sheep to communicate to the people, but the people didn't understand. But notice Jesus didn't berate those who didn't understand. He didn't belittle them for not picking up on what was he was illustrating. Jesus simply said to them again, Jesus is very patient with us. He will communicate to us in the clearest ways, and if we don't pick up on what he is trying to communicate to us, he will patiently speak to us again and again until the message becomes clearer to us. Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Jesus says, most assuredly, Greek, amen, amen. And without a doubt, I say to you, I am Again, we see Jesus using this powerful I am phrase with regard to himself. Uh, in this chapter, Jesus will use the phrase I am six more times. It is clear that Jesus is using the imagery of a shepherd and a sheep to point out he is the shepherd God. As David in the Psalms proclaimed with the words, the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23, 1. Jesus is a shepherd at heart. When Jesus looked at the multitudes of people, he was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Mark 6, 34. Jesus yearns to gather people into his fold, and as he looks with compassion on the wandering, strange sheep of the world, he sees teaching them many things as the means to feed their hungering souls. Will you repent of your sins and call Jesus your shepherd? And now we know that repent translates in original uh, scrolls. It means to uh, change your mind, to turn around and look. They were telling them, 
change your mind about who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. He is uh, the lamb given to take away sins. Okay, that's what that means. Jesus is the door of the sheep. The sheep's folds in the fields and the community sheepfold in the village had no physical door or gate. The shepherd or doorman served as the door to enter the exit. Enter and exit the sheepfold. Jesus as the door is to be differentiated from a door. There are not many doors to the sheepfold of the Lord. There is only one door, the door, Jesus. Jesus is the most assured and certain entryway to finding protection. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and only way to salvation and eternal life. John 14, 6. Jesus is the only way into God's heavenly, eternal sheepfold. The, and then, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Amen. He's our protector. So, eight, all who ever came before me and th are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. There are those historically and even today who try to supplant and replace Jesus as the means to what a person needs in life. But watch out for people who speak much about themselves and little about Jesus. Watch for people who put the focus on themselves. Watch for those who fleece the flock of God instead of feed them. Number nine, I am at the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. If anyone said, Jesus says, if anyone enters by me, if means there is a condition, a decision to be made in regards to Jesus, Jesus presents the truth of the gospel and we must respond in faith. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the dangers of this world? Yes. There will be times in this, well, he likens it to this world, but I'm, I'm talking about right now. Right what is about to happen. Jesus is the only one that will give you hope when this tribulation starts, okay? Jesus offers safety in and through his such circumstances. Jesus speaks of salvation in the context of the illustration of a shepherd and a sheep. Jesus, then Jesus states, and will go in and out and find pasture. When Jesus is our shepherd, we travel in this world, and Jesus will keep us well-fed spiritually all the way. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. It's true. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Okay. This is a lot of commentary, guys. 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Amen. Jesus laid down his life for us. He is our sin bearer. He was made sin for us so that his righteousness could be given to us. As we put our faith in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Amen. Amen. He was made sin for us and nailed on the cross. We are forgiven when we stand in the Lord. We all fall short of his glory. We all miss the mark. We are, our flesh is like filthy rags before God. So 12, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, the one, the one does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. <coughs> Sorry. A hireling is a hired hand, someone who works for pay. Jesus points out he was not a hired hand who would run from danger. Jesus is the owner of the sheep in his fold. A hired hand, even if paid well, would not risk their life for the flock. At some point, they will say, enough is enough, or they're not paying me enough to do this. Not so with the owner of the sheep. The owner of the sheep has their life invested in the sheep. Jesus will never desert those he gave his life for. Amen. 
I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep. I am known by my own. Okay, the word know in Greek means to know, be aware of, perceive, understand, be conscious of. Jesus is aware of us and always has us on his mind. All right, as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. The Father knows Jesus is truth. Jesus knows the Father is truth. Jesus and the Father have the perfect relationship. Redemption, salvation, the gospel flow out of the Father and the Son's relationship and is imputed to us once we believe. Okay, and then he talks about the other sheep, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Now that's the Jews and the Gentiles, because at this time he's talking to the Jews. <coughs> we are the Gentiles. We are grafted into the tree, into the vine. And now we are adopted sons and daughters of the Most High God, reconciled back to God through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Jesus is alluding to his atoning death on the cross as well as his resurrection. Amen. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Amen. He rose again. Amen. All right, and then I wanted to share this with you. Romans 3, 25 through 27. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he must be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what? By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. So now we're not in this old covenant law of works, okay? Now we're in this covenant called the law of faith. Those are our works that we do. We have faith in Jesus Christ that he was the son of God. All right. And when you accept him as your Lord and Savior, when you feel something in your heart, when the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart to make a decision then you make a decision and it doesn't matter what process you do it from like Sabrina Nisveen. She's right. She did a video and said, look, there's no process. Some, someone might say, I, you know, just feel pricked in their heart. And then they say, I don't want to go to hell, you know, and then there's a conversion that takes place in someone's heart. It doesn't have to be glitter and banners. Uh, I came out of the water speaking in tongues, you know, <laughs> or uh, I, I bowed my head and I said this long sinner's prayer thing. It doesn't have to be like that. It's your heart. It's your heart. And God is the searcher of the heart. He knows what's in your heart. And he knows if you have faith in him, if you believe that he is who he said he was. And, um, Oh, there's just so many people out there that I see it just, it hurts my heart because I know everything I've been through in my life, the Lord has always been there for me. And he, 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 he loves us. He loves the sheep and the sheep hear his voice and he leaves those 99 to, to find that one. And he brings them back with love. He's not beating on them. He's not breaking their legs so they can't leave. Um, he is love. And, and that's, that's the, the greatest commandment, the two greatest commandments that rest on us is love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself because God is love. And that's what it's about. He loved the world so much. He gave his only begotten son in order that everybody that believes upon him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's John three sixteen. He said, believe upon me and you'll have everlasting life. 
And that is the true gospel. That is the true gospel of grace and love and mercy. It is the new covenant created between man and God. That Jesus came and, and, and gave his life so that we could be reconciled back to God through what Jesus did. Not by what we do, by what Jesus did. And our belief and our, the law of faith guys. Okay. And I, I feel so bad because I use, uh, the sister's name in one of my videos and I had not checked her out. I did not know that she was preaching law, you know, la, 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 la. <laughs> um, and I don't want to lead anybody into fear, guilt, shame, and condemnation because that's not, uh, what the scripture says, you know, um, so just be careful who you're watching because, uh, the Lord doesn't want you in that bondage anymore. Um, the bondage of fear, the Lord does not give you a spirit of fear. He does not say you're not working hard enough. You're not saved. Like that's not our God. Our God is love. Our God is love. Okay, and I love you guys, and I hope you're having a, a great day.